Good morning, saints. That's what you are, you know. Whether you realize it or not, whether you feel like it or not, this is the good news. This is the gospel for you this morning on this All Saints Sunday. We're celebrating a very simple but radical truth, and it's just this, that you are a saint. And that primarily and fundamentally has nothing to do with you and whether you're weak with saintly. That's good news. And when we think about saints, I mean, my mind goes directly to the Mother Teresas of the world, the Billy Grahams of the world, or those for whom a pope, and this is how someone becomes a saint in the Catholic tradition, of which you should know we're a part. The Anglicans came, they're just Catholic rebels, that's all you are. <laughs> At times a pope will decree that someone's a saint, and oftentimes we think about their lives and we think about the things that they did. Why is Mother Teresa a saint? She's a saint because she moved to Calcutta and she served the poor, living her whole life among the poor and needy, sometimes not even have shoes who, who, that fit her because she gave them away to others. That, you know what? Here's the glorious good news of the gospel. That is in fact not at all what made Mother Teresa Saint Teresa. Amen. Let me tell you the thing that made Mother Teresa Saint Teresa. Her Papa God destined her to be a saint. And, and, and he, in his good pleasure of his divine will, before the ages began, before Mother Teresa ever gave a shoe to someone who needed one, in any slum of Calcutta, God looked upon her and said, that's my daughter. And, and in his grace adopted her into his kingdom. That's what made her a saint. And, and, and this is how it works. No papal decree needed. It's the sovereign call of the Most High God. And, and Mother Teresa just spends the rest of her life living in to the identity that she got from Jesus for free. That's the good news of All Saints Sunday because you share in that story. You are equally a saint, just like Saint Teresa and that has equally to do with the person and work of Jesus Christ, who did for you what you could never do for yourself. Amen. He gave you his righteousness. You wear it like a gift. As long as I'm your priest, I will regularly remind you of that because we forget it. I forget it. And that's the thing that makes you saint. And the rest of your life is just simply living out of that. So in good Presbyterian form, don't I look like a Presbyterian? Check me out. I got my little suit jacket and everything. I'm going to give you three, three points. I want to talk three points about being a saint this morning. And if you've got your Bibles, open them to Ephesians chapter 1 because that's where we're going. I mean, in the Episcopal Church, we, we, we build our buildings. We name them after saints. St. Saint Luke. St. Saint Luke's Cathedral. St. Matthias. That was the name of my church in Asheville before I moved here. St. Matthias was the twelfth and a half disciple that replaced Judas after that tragic incident in the garden. Remember that? St. Barnabas. We have a Barnabas, Paul's traveling missionary journey. On the first one, he had a big fight over a guy named Mark and ended up parting ways with Paul in the second missionary journey. St. Peter, the preeminent, foot his, put his foot in his mouth saint. He's a lot like me. What was it that made these people saints? It wasn't the things that they did. It was the thing that Jesus did for them, and it was them just simply yielding to that and living it out. It was them living out their identity, and I want to give you a, a, a one-liner if you're taking notes. I want you to consider writing this down. Sainthood is what you are. It's demonstrated by what you do. Sainthood is your identity, and that's wrapped up in the person and work of Jesus. And we're going to see that. We're going to see three things. Here's my good Presbyterian three-point sermon. Ready? Three things in Ephesians. That you're a saint because God called you to be one. And I believe that. And wait till you see it in the text. You're a saint because God destined for that to be the truth and the trajectory of your life. Point number two. You're a saint because through faith... Your life has been incorporated in Christ. 
You turned your heart to Jesus. And Paul's going to repeat this word over and over in Ephesians 1. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. He's going to wrap everything that you are into the person and work of Jesus that you, in fact, participate in. Jesus' life is your life. His obedience is your obedience. His perfection is your perfection. That's the gift of the gospel. And that's, in fact, what makes you a saint. And, and then the third thing we're going to see in Ephesians is this, that God didn't leave you in this place alone, that in your sainthood, he's now deposited his very Holy Spirit inside of you, which does two things. It seals you as his sons and daughters, and it empowers you for ministry. It, it's literally like a badge that you wear. And, and when the whole spirit world sees you, they see a saint a righteous son and daughter of the Most High King. That's his spirit inside of you. It's a guarantee. It's a pledge towards your inheritance as God's kids. And it empowers you to do the types of things that the great saints of old have done. It empowers you in a, in a fearful way to go beyond yourself. But that going beyond of yourself is not what makes you a saint. You following? It's simply an outworking of the saint, sainthood you have in Jesus. All right, here's a plug for all of you insider Episcopalians. You're going to love this. Ready? Write down this website, lectionarypage.net. Every good Episcopalian should go there every day, and here's why. <laughs> Did you know that 30 times throughout your calendar year, the Episcopal Church celebrates saints? There's, there's a list in the prayer book, Feasts and Holy Days. And it's 30 times throughout the year, and today's one of them, All Saints. We're celebrating all the saints today. But it's 30 times literally every couple of weeks where the Episcopal Church says, Hey, we're celebrating this saint or this person. We're celebrating this thing that happened in Christendom several hundred years ago. In fact, if that's not enough for you, also on lectionarypage.net. I know, I want to see the pencils going. Scribble it down. If you click on this little blue link right at the top, it says Lesser Feasts and Fasts. And you're like, what is that? Let me tell you what it is. It is a big long list of over 300 saints for almost every day of the calendar year. You can literally read about a different saint that mattered for Christianity for every day, almost every day, for the entire church year. And lucky for you, all their links are in blue and you click on them and it takes you right to Wikipedia and tells you what they did. But, but here's what you're going to see. You're going to see normal, ordinary people, just like you. But ordinary people who were destined. Remember my three points? They were destined by God to be saints. Who Number two, their whole life was incorporated in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Their life was about Jesus, not about themselves. That's, in fact, what made them saint. And then they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and that was the thing that drove them to participate in the saintly life. I'll read it for you again. Sainthood is what you are. It's demonstrated by what you do. All right, let's turn to Ephesians. If you've got your Bibles, I'd encourage you to bring your Bibles to church. Um, we usually use the lectionary reading from the bulletin here, but sometimes I sort of wander from the text that's printed in your bulletin. So if you've got your Bibles, you get the full deal. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1, and I want to begin in your bulletin on uh, the, the first line of the passage from Ephesians, which is verse 11. Listen to what Paul says. You're going to hear this first point here. Actually, first and second point. In Christ. Remember I told you that's a repeated phrase? It, I mean, if you're into color in your Bibles, I would encourage you, every time you see in Christ in Ephesians 1, just box it off. It's everywhere. It, it's like a dozen times in chapter 1. Listen to what Paul says. In Christ, you have obtained an inheritance. How'd you get it? Through your saintly life? Nope. You were given it to free through the person of Jesus, through his efforts, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things by his counsel and will. Be encouraged, sinners. And who should I look at? <laughs> I look at myself. Listen, I, I don't care what kind of week you had. Well, yes, I do, because I want you to have an abundant life. 
But some of y'all walk in here, you feel like a worm today. I get it. I'm there often. And the good news of the gospel is that God's destined you to be a son or daughter. And he did that before you did the things that you feel particularly guilty about right now. Let me, let me read it again. He, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will. If you've got your Bibles, look how Paul starts his book. In verse 3, blessed, he says, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who, and he's going to use past tense here. Has blessed us, here's that word, in Christ. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And listen when he did it. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. To be holy and blameless before him in love. He, here's that word, destined us for adoption as his children. And here it is. In Christ Jesus. That is good news, saints. I mean, this is a radical truth of the gospel. You cannot hear this enough. And the more you understand it, the more it will set your heart free. And in fact, will be the thing that motivates you to start acting like the saint that you are. Before the foundations of the universe were laid, God had you on his mind. And, and he says to you, that one... That's my boy. That one, that's my daughter. That one, I'm adopting that one into my family. I mean, think about the imagery of adoption. <laughs> adoption sends this message. You didn't earn that. I mean, who, you, you understand adoption. Somebody doesn't get adopted into someone else's family because of them. They get adopted into someone else's family because of the goodness and loving kindness of the family that brought them in. It's the papa that gets the credit for adoption. He filled out the paperwork. He paid the price. And, and that's a perfect, beautiful description of the gospel of grace. Your papa God adopted you into his kingdom. And that has to do with his goodness, not yours. And he planned that from the beginning of the universe. And that's the thing that makes you a saint. I mean, Paul loves to address his New Testament church this way. Listen to how he opens the letter in Ephesians. To the saints... Who are in Ephesus, faithful, here's the word, in Christ Jesus. You're a saint, you rascals in Ephesus. <laughs> Why? Because of Christ Jesus. Verse 7, if you have your Bibles in Ephesians, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. That's the thing that makes us a saint. That's my first and second point. God destined you to sainthood, and he did it in Christ Jesus. If you go through the list of saints in your lesser feasts and fasts, you see all kinds of amazing stories. And over the week, I mean, I'm not the brightest tool in the shed, so I'm going down that list, and I'm trying to find names that I recognize. And, and I found Augustine. Anyone ever heard of this guy? Augustine of Hippo, bishop of the 4th century in North Africa. I'm like, okay, I remember him from church history. I'm going to look him up. Augustine, probably the most important theologian in all of Christianity, I think. And here's why. Augustine developed essential doctrines like the doctrine of original sin. I mean, he gets this out of the Bible, but the very idea that you and I really don't earn anything from God except for his wrath, that's in fact what's coming towards us because of our rebellion against him. And that anything better than that is pure grace and pure gift? That, that's actually a New Testament concept. But Augustine was the first person to clearly articulate it in such a way. And, and I think that much of Reformation theology, if you fast forward a thousand years to the 1400s, much of Reformation theology, what Martin Luther said about God, he got so much of that from Augustine. And, and so in that sense, we really owe this guy a real weight, historically. And let me tell you about Augustine. Saint, by the way, Augustine. He wasn't no saint. I mean, if you know about him, he was a professor of philosophy living in Milan, and he was unsaved as a goat. Goats are pretty unsaved. He was a ladies' man. He was someone of ill repute. Just let your mind wander. 
But, but here's the thing about Augustine. God's destining him for sainthood. And the plan of God in his life mattered more than Augustine's train wreck living. And his story goes like this. He, he's in his backyard. And he's been thinking about Christianity for quite some time. Philosophically. And wondering whether there's something to it. This is the, fourth, the 400s. Early 400s. So Christianity's been going on for several hundred years as a movement. He's considering these things. And in front of him is a text of Romans. But he's not read it. And it's a true story. And from the garden next door, he hears in Latin, tole lege, a little boy, probably. Tole lege, which means take it up and read it. And he interprets that to be a sign and a message from God. Pick up the book and read it, dude. So he does. He picks up Romans and he, he plays Russian roulette with the Bible. Anyone ever done that? You just kind of open it, see what you're going to get? This is what he read. He tells us this as he confesses his life. He read this, Romans 13, verse 13 and 14. Not in rioting and drunkenness. Not in debauchery and wantonness. Not in strife and envying. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And God opens his eyes. He opens his eyes. That, hey, hey, Augustine, this is not the life I have planned for you. I've, in fact, destined a completely different thing for you. And it, it starts like this with your sainthood. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Augustine gives his life to Jesus. And in, in that moment, before he wrote his confessions, before his city on the hill, a famous work, about living out Christianity, he becomes a saint because he puts on Jesus. But then, the Holy Spirit starts moving him to start acting, to start living into his sainthood. And that's the next thing I want you to see in Ephesians. If you've got your Bibles, I'm going to start in verse 13. <clears throat> it's in your bulletin as well. You'll find it. In him, that's Jesus, also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. And this is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. Hey, this is part of the good news of the gospel too, saints, that when you turn your heart to Jesus, when you put on Jesus, just as Augustine did, he, he doesn't leave you as an orphan. He literally adopts you into his family, and he places within you his very spirit, and it's all of his spirit. There, there are no second-class Christians. And you need to own it and believe it. And I know that I don't think for anyone in here the Catholic Church has officially canonized you as a saint yet. You need to give a bunch more money first, all right? So just come on. Fork it up. A million bucks, I'll make you whatever you want to be. But nonetheless, you are a saint. And, and you're filled with the same Holy Spirit that the greatest saints of old have been filled with. God doesn't have second-class citizens. He's given you His fullness of His Spirit. And the very first thing that does for you is it literally marks you. It seals you. It declares before the spirit world that you're a son or a daughter of the King. It is literally your invisible ticket to heaven. That's what Paul means when he says, you were marked with the promised Holy Spirit, and this is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption. God, when you take the dirt nap, and you stand before God, whether it's, that was a good one, right? Metaphor, I don't know. Can you picture the visual? And you get to those pearly gates, if that's what it looks like. You're going to see a Papa God is going to look you straight in the face and go, that's mine, and I'll tell you why, because I see myself in him, in her, my spirit. Come on in, son, daughter. Well, here's the other thing that spirit does. Is it pushes you to do things you'd have never done before. If you've got your Bibles, go to verse 17. Paul starts praying for the Ephesians. I pray, he says in verse 17. It's also in your bulletin. 
that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. And, and here's what Paul wants them to know. So that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, he's saying, hey, wake up, realize your identity, understand who you are. With the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may understand what is the rich inheritance you share among the saints. And, verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe? And then Paul qualifies this power. Hey, give me a good example of this power. Okay, I'll give you one. According to the greatness of his power, verse 20, and God put this power to work in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead. This is the crazy thing, saints, that the very Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now activated and alive and present in you. I mean, I don't believe that sometimes about some of y'all. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't believe it about myself. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that type of resurrection power is now literally dwelling inside of me. And that is the thing that the spirit world sees that marks me as a son or daughter of the Most High God. Dang, if that's true, let's get after it. <laughs> I mean, if God is for us in that way, who could be against us? What's going to stop this gospel? And, and what's going to stop this church? <sighs> Nothing. You know, the, you know the only thing that will stop it? You and me. As, as we fail to remember who we are. Another one of the saints from the list. I'm scrolling down the list, and I remember this guy. His name was Gregory the Great. Now, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, because i got a Reformation scholar in the front row, and I'm a shameless plug for November 20th. Duncan Hardy will be giving an amazing talk on the Anglican history of the Reformation, and he's sitting right in front of me. He's going to correct my heresy, I'm sure. He could probably tell us all about Gregory the Great, but Gregory the Great was the Catholic Pope in Rome at the end of the 6th century. And let me tell you why I think he was so great. The guy was filled with the Holy Spirit. He's in Rome in the 6th century. And, and the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, starts giving him a vision for a nation and a people. Let me tell you why his name stuck out to me. Because a couple months ago I went to England and I went to a church planting conference and it was put on by the Gregory Center for Church Planting. And I walked away going, why is it called the Gregory Center? Who is this Gregory guy? And, and now I've started putting it together. I get this list from Lesser Feasts and Fasts. I'm like, dang, Gregory the Great, he was the Catholic Pope in the 6th century who's sitting back in Rome, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, he starts having thoughts like, you know what? Let's go evangelize the entire English world. He, through, the, through the Holy Spirit, he starts to get a vision for an entire people group, the Anglos, that live on these islands off the coast of what's now France. The entire English world. That's a big vision. And, and so Gregory commissions missionaries. Another Augustine, not Augustine of Hippo, another one. He literally puts a team together and they sail across the English Channel and they start living in a foreign land with a foreign people. They establish a church at Canterbury, which should sound familiar to you if you're an Anglican. Canterbury Cathedral. That's why we're here. You following? Why does the Anglican church exist? Why does Christianity exist all over the British Isles? Partly because one guy, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and the story's a lot bigger than that. St. Patrick is a part of it. There are so many other saints who caught visions for God and went for it. But part of why we're here is because people got strategic to say, you know what, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, we're taking it across the English Channel, and we're going to see the resurrected God win a nation. That's what I'm talking about. Well, listen, that winning of the nation, which eventually invaded all of the Anglo world with Christianity and would eventually turn into the Anglican church, the Church of England, that's not what made Gregory a saint. 
He was simply living out of the sainthood he had in Jesus. When, 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 he, when he meets Jesus face to face, it's not going to be his missionary commissioning of Augustine. That's the first thing on God's lips. He wears the very righteousness of Jesus when he walks through heaven. That's what God sees, not him. And that matters because Gregory was a person just like you and me. He stunk just like you and just like me. So let me put it before you, saints. Step into the stream of the story of God and rest in your identity. Be sure of who you are in Jesus. And then start praying dangerous prayers. God, what would you have me do with this exceedingly great power that you've placed inside of me? And, and let me tell you how you get there. And this is, this is for everybody in this room, but I'm thinking particularly the young ones who have a life ahead of them. You baby step towards it. You, you want to be the next Gregory the Great? Baby step towards it. Make your bed. Do your homework. Just do the next thing and the right thing. See what God makes of it. Let's stand together.